In this video, we're going to cover Chapter 6, which will build on what we learned in Chapter 5 on merchandising activities, but focus more on inventories. So the learning objectives for this chapter, discuss how to classify and determine inventory, apply inventory cost flow methods, and discuss their financial effects, indicate the effects of inventory errors on the financial statements, and explain the statement presentation and analysis of inventory. We learned in Chapter 5 that merchandising companies buy inventory, sell it to their customers. They have one classification, simply called inventory. In a manufacturing company, there will be three classifications of inventory. Raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Raw materials is the materials they buy that they're going to use in the production process to finish to build their goods, their finished goods that they're going to sell to their customers. Work in process is work that has been started but not completed to its final form. Now you have work in process throughout the month. That isn't as important as it is at the end of the accounting period. That's when we need to make sure we can evaluate the work in process properly. And then the third classification, finished goods. These are goods that are completely finished through the manufacturing process. They're ready to be sold to customers. Uh, they just haven't shipped out to customers yet. Then at the bottom there, you see regardless of the classification, inventory, no matter which classification, is all considered current asset on the balance sheet. So when you look at the uh, balance sheet and trying to determine where to put inventory, the different accounts, it's all under inventory. You'll get a subtotal for total inventory, and it's a current asset. Physical inventory. So companies count their inventory, and it's referred to as, as physical inventory. Two reasons, or two reasons when we do this. In the perpetual system, it's to check of the accuracy of the inventory records. So to make sure that your recording of the purchases and the sales each time it happens got done correctly. Uh, and then determine the amount of inventory lost due to wasted raw material, shoplifting, employee theft, or anything else. There could be reasons why you lose inventory. Under the periodic system, they have to take the count to determine the inventory on hand. Remember the periodic system, they don't record the purchases and cost of goods sold in detail each time it happens. So they need to do this count of inventory um, to determine what's on hand. And then once they have that, the second part is they can determine the cost of goods sold for the period. So perpetual systems is done periodically, um, not done every period necessarily. Periodic system, you have to do it every period to uh, in order to get the correct value of inventory on the balance sheet and the correct cost of goods sold on the income statement. When we say taking a physical inventory, what does that really mean? Well, depending on the type of material, it could be simply counting the, the inventory. Um, it could be weighing the, the inventory. Um, measuring in some way, so liquids, um, you'll look at the, um, the volume of the, of the material to determine uh, how much is on hand. Um, other words that you, you think about or you might hear, um, you'll say, you know, we're taking, a, we're taking an inventory, we're going to count inventory, we're going to do a physical. Um, those are all kind of common phrases that companies use when they talk about it internally. Um, they try to do this when the business is closed or business is slow. Okay, so you don't want a lot of movement of inventory, either inbound or outbound or being manufactured, because um, it's going to mess up the, the counts. Um, there's ways around it. So if you can't uh, totally shut down a, a facility or a plant um, or shipping, um, you'll have to just take expert cautions to figure out how to do it. And it's simply done at the end of the accounting period. Now, a lot of times, um, you know, what I saw when, when I was working is we would do it um, in November or December, so close to the end of the year. Um, it didn't doesn't have to be right at the end of the period, uh, but then you have processes that 
we call rolling the inventory forward or back from whenever we took the count to the the accounting date and that's something the auditors look for and make sure you did that correctly as well so um, if you took inventory in the 15th of December for example you would have to then look at all the transactions from the 15th to the 31st of December and make sure you account for those correctly um, uh, in doing that and a lot of times auditors want to be there and watch you take the inventory and watch the counts and um, uh, you know do their own testing so a note over there on the ethics note a salad oil company filled its storage tanks mostly with water okay oil sits on water so oil would go come to the top so when you looked into the tank it looked like there was it was full of oil um, auditors thought they were full a lot of times um, in the case of liquid in tanks um, they might have sticks that you put in till it hits the bottom of the tank to make sure that there's no false bottom within the tank um, and then they look at it when it comes out to make sure it's um, you know the, the salad oil in this case what they would expect to see but since it's on top it all coated the um, sticks as it came out uh, potentially uh, the company also said it had more tanks than it really did it repainted the numbers on the tanks to confuse the auditors so they were um, uh, you know perpetrating a fraud um, and the way they did it it was hard for the auditors to um, to catch it uh, because of the way the nature of um, uh, the liquid and that type of thing um, it'd be harder to say that they had um, uh, I don't know uh, coils of steel um, because you can't hide those as well or you can't um, look like you have more of those than you than you do when you have a um, a, a liquid like they did here <clears throat> so another insight here Leslie Fay um, it's a women's apparel maker they got convicted of falsifying inventory records to boost net income um, Executives at Craig Electronics were accused of defrauding lenders by manipulating inventory records. They classified defective goods as new or refurbished and claimed that it owned certain shipments from overseas suppliers when in fact Craig either did not own the shipments or the shipments did not exist. Okay, so inventory is an area that is, um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to say easy because it's not easy to to commit a fraud, but um, it's a way that can be manipulated in a way that that makes the numbers look better than they are. Um, so, what effect does it have on the financial statements if you overstate inventory? The balance sheet looks stronger because inventory and retained earnings are overstated. Income statement looks better because cost of goods sold is understated and income is overstated. Okay, so not only does it make your income look better, but it also makes your balance sheet look better, and um, you know the um, the companies can can meet some objectives or can announce better results than they actually are. So it's an area that. Um, it is looked at a lot by auditors because it is a way that companies can manipulate their earnings. Determining ownership of goods. We talked about this a little bit in the last chapter. Goods in transit. Purchased goods not yet received. Sold goods not yet delivered. So at the end of each accounting period, you need to look at these shipments and determine who is the legal owner of the inventory and whose books that inventory should be on so it should only be included in one company or the other not both and it's determined by who has legal title we looked at these uh, last chapter FOB shipping point so the the buyer pays the sh freight costs in this case ownership passes from the seller to the buyer at the seller's location once it's picked up by a, um, uh, a shipping company. FOB destination, the seller pays for the freight cost and they own the merchandise until it's delivered to the buyer at the buyer's location. Okay, so those are important to know 
when we look at ending inventory at the end of the period and make adjustments to make sure we include or exclude certain inventories. So a question, goods in transit should be included in the inventory of the buyer when, so is it A, public carrier accept the goods from the seller, goods reach the buyer, terms of the sale or FOB destination, or the terms of the sale or FOB shipping point. So when does it in, being when does it included in the inventory of the buyer? The answer is D when the terms of the sale are FOB shipping point. Okay, so yes. Public carrier accept the goods. That's true because it, it that could be a true statement because the buyer could hire a public carrier to, to ship the goods, but that in and of itself doesn't mean that it's the buyer's inventory um, unless the terms are also FOB shipping point. Okay, and then the others two are relating to FOB destination, which means that it's the seller's inventory until it reaches the buyer's destination. Consigned goods. So this is where a company holds the goods of other parties. They try to sell the goods for them for a fee, but they never take ownership of the goods. Okay. So many car, boat, antique dealers sell goods on consignment. Okay. Why do they do this? They avoid the risk of purchasing an item that I will be able to sell. So the seller, whoever's got the storefront or whoever's holding the inventory and, and having it offered for sale doesn't want to risk buying something that they can't sell so the owner of the inventory just uses their place as a way to um, to sell it amazon has some um, items on their site that are really cons i don't know if they're even consignment inventory but you can think of it as consignment because there's third-party sellers on amazon so amazon never owns those goods it's just a conduit to for the seller to reach different buyers sometimes they may be in it if they're in an amazon warehouse in that case and it's a third party that's actually selling it it would be consigned inventory for amazon so another fraud okay so ted he was the ceo of clock manufacturer daily industries he had expensive taste so he took out large loans he collateralized those loans with his shares in the company stock. So he owned the company stock. He put those up as, as collateral um, to get these loans. But part of the loan agreements was if the stock price fell, he had to provide the bank with more shares of stock. So he either had to buy more or put more up as collateral. Um, and, and, and eventually, if he didn't have that, he'd have to start paying back the loan. So in order to keep the stock price high and achieve target net income figures, he coerced employees of the company to alter inventory figures. So the way he did that was at physical counts, they changed the inventory control tags. Okay, so what happens in when you, when you take a physical inventory count is you have sheets or tags that you actually put on pallets that indicate the count and that type of thing. And then they, um, uh, you know, get those summarized and then accountants make any adjustments they need to do into the, the computer system, into the book. So they would take a tag, it might say 20 units of a particular item was there. They could change the tag so it read 220 instead of 20, so there'd be more inventory on hand also the unit costs were changed so if it was 125 dollars per unit we could add a zero and it would be 1250 dollars per unit so it would increase the value of the inventory okay both of those would reduce the cost of goods sold which would then increase net income and he made 245 thousand dollars by doing this so the missing control which we'll get into in Chapter seven, uh, independent internal verification. So they should have someone else spot checking the inventory with the records periodically. Um, a lot of times you have, uh, when, when there's a change that's made 
into the accounting system because of the inventory count. If it's a large change, for example, 20 to 220, um, they may send somebody different out to do the count to verify that there really is 220. So there's ways you can do that uh, and catch that with, with the internal verification. So another do it here has been company completed its inventory count. It arrived at a total inventory value of $200,000. You have been given the information listed below. Discuss how this information affects the reported cost of inventory. So one has been included in the inventory goods held on consignment for Falls Company costing $15,000. The company did not include in the count purchased goods of $10,000, which were in transit and the terms were FOB shipping point. And the company did not include in the count sold inventory with a cost of $12,000, which was in transit terms FOB shipping point. What we need to do now is determine if these three items were handled correctly or not, or do we need to make an adjustment to what we came up with with our inventory value of $200,000. So the first one, goods of $15,000 held on consignment should be deducted from the inventory count. So it was on the floor of the warehouse, they counted it. You know, that's an easy mistake to do that people don't understand maybe who the um, owner of that inventory is, if it's not labeled right or, or not. So they counted it. Well, they shouldn't have, so they should deduct that $15,000 they counted from the total value of the inventory. The second one, goods of $10,000 purchased FOB shipping point should be added to the inventory count. Since it's in transit, it wasn't there to count, but you need to go look and um, see if you've got notifications of shipments to know that they haven't been delivered yet. Since it's FOB shipping point and it's coming to you, you need to include that in your count. And then item three was treated correctly so it was FOB shipping point on a sale. So the buyer owned it once it shipped. So it would be out of our inventory. Since it physically wasn't there, they didn't count it. And they cor correctly handled it and treated that correctly by not including it in the count. So our inventory should be $195,000, not the $200,000. And we get that by the $200,000 from the count minus the 15,000 from the goods held on consignment and add the $10,000 of the purchase that was in transit. Now we'll talk about the inventory cost flow methods. So inventory is accounted for cost. Remember we talked about the historical cost um, assumption um, in recording items at cost. So inventory is one that is it's accounted for a cost. The cost includes all expenditures necessary to acquire the goods and place them in a condition ready for sale. So remember in chapter five, when we the buyer paid for the freight, they added the cost of that freight into the cost of the inventory. That's an example of what this is meaning. If there's other costs related to getting that inventory ready to sell, um, then you would include those costs as well. Unit costs are applied to quantities to compute the total cost of the inventory and the cost of goods sold using the following methods. So there's four methods that we're going to talk about. There could be other methods um, available and in, in, in use, but these are the most common and the ones that um, others are derived from. So we're going to focus on these four uh, in this chapter. So we have specific identification first in, first out, last in, first out, and average cost. Now note the last three, the first in, first out FIFO, last in, last, first out LIFO, and the average cost are all cost flow assumptions. Okay, The physical flow of the goods do not have to actually um, follow that cost flow assumption. It's just a, an assumption of the of the cost, not the physical flow. So let's look at some examples. 
So, Krivitz TV Company purchases three identical 50-inch TVs at different dates with different costs. So, $700, $750, and $800. During the year, they sold two sets at $1,200 each. And then we have a chart here that shows that. So, three purchases, three different costs, and then a sale of two TVs. And they sold it for $1,200 each. Okay, so we're going to use this information to look at all three or all four costing methods. The first one, specific identification. That just says that we're going to specifically identify which items were sold and what the cost of those items were. So if they sold the TVs that were purchased on February 3rd and May 22nd, then its cost of goods sold would be $15,000, $700 from the purchase of February 30th, $800 from the purchase of May 22nd. May 22nd. Its ending inventory is $750, which is the cost of the TV that wasn't sold. And there's a little graphic there that kind of shows those that flow specifically identifying the cost to the TVs that were sold. So specific identification is an actual physical flow costing method in which items still in inventory are specifically costed to arrive at the cost of total inventory. So this practice is relatively rare because it's hard and a lot of work to track each item of inventory and um, you know, track the, where it's at, if it got sold, if it's still in any inventory. Um, and a lot of times uh, inventory is interchangeable, so it's really hard to keep track of that. So, so most companies make assumptions about which units were sold, and that's called the, the cost flow assumptions. They make cost flow assumptions. Okay. And then over there in the note, a major disadvantage of the specific identification is that management may be able to manipulate net income. So they can say, you know, lower cost units were sold when maybe they weren't, um, and, and that would increase net income. Um, they could reduce, um, you know, the, the, they could reduce net income by selling units purchased at a high cost. Okay, and so they may want to, if they're over shooting their um, forecasts or are going to pay higher taxes, so they might want to lower net income for, for some of those reasons. They just say that the higher cost items were sold. Okay, so it's a way that they can manipulate the earnings if they're using specific identification. So here's some information. We had a beginning inventory of 100 units at a unit cost of 10. We made three purchases, the first of 200 units, second of 300 units, and the fourth one of 400 units. We have unit cost increasing each time we make a purchase. So we see at the bottom we have total units available for sale, 1,000 units. So it's the 900 that we purchased plus the 100 in beginning inventory. And the total cost by taking the extension for each line and adding together is $12,000. We had 450 units in Indian inventory, which means we sold 550 units. So this is all, all this information can be put into this formula at the bottom here. You take your beginning inventory plus your cost of goods purchased minus your ending inventory will equal, equal your cost of goods sold. Okay, And this is valid and can be used and should be used for both units and costing. And again, this is a common formula that we're going to see in different types of forms. We'll see it a lot in this chapter, but when we talk about some other concepts, the same idea of beginning plus additions minus ending is what the subtractions are kind of theory um, we use when we're, we're analyzing different accounts as well. So we'll talk about first in, first out first. Costs of the earliest goods purchased are the first to be recognized in determining cost of goods sold. Okay, so the first ones in are the first ones out for cost of goods sold. It often parallels actual physical flow. So if you think about it, 
if you buy some some merchandise and you start to sell it you're, you're gonna probably sell the first things you bought um, especially if they're perishable grocery stores are, are really good at this is selling the um, older items first um, even if they have some newer ones in the back or something um, but it doesn't have to actually match those it often parallels it but it doesn't necessarily have to match it companies determine the cost of any inventory by taking the unit cost of the most recent purchases and working backward until all units of inventory have been costed okay so when we compute the ending inventory we're going to go backwards from what the name says so the name of this assumption is FIFO first in first out that's the cost flow of the cost going out so if you look at your ending inventory it's made up of your last purchases and you work back until you um, you know have it uh, accounted for so if we look at this sample data we saw just a minute ago thousand units available twelve thousand dollars cost available our ending inventory is 450 units that we saw from the other slide so we start with the last purchase November 27th we purchased 400 units okay so this is what this where this is coming from at $13 per unit $5,200 okay but we had 450 units in inventory so we need more units we go to the next purchase we purchased 300 units for $12 only 50 of those are left in inventory to get our total 450 so we cost those 50 at $12 600 Indian inventory total cost is 5800 so then we look at our cost of goods sold so we take what's available our $12,000 so that's the cost of goods available for sale which is beginning inventory plus purchases we subtract our ending inventory 5800 that we calculated over here so that means our cost of goods sold is six thousand two hundred dollars and we have some graphics here so we have the charts that we looked at from the last slide here but then graphically here's what it looks like these are the dollar amounts of the beginning inventory and purchases so a thousand beginning first purchase was 2200 3600 was the last the third purchase second purchase I'm sorry and the 5200 was the the last purchase so the beginning first purchase and most of the second purchase are all part of cost of goods sold in any inventory is the last purchase and some of the second to last purchase okay there's this helpful hint down here another way of thinking about the calculation of FIFO ending inventory is the Lish assumption last in still here so the inventory the last ones in are the are still the ones in inventory to be honest I never heard or used this in uh, practice but if it helps you think about how to how to cost any inventory and then cost cost of goods sold by all means use it now we'll talk about the next assumption last in first out FIFO so the cost of the last goods purchased are the first ones to be sold it seldom coincides with the actual physical flow of inventory and we'll see some examples of um, as we go through these is how can you sell something you bought three months from the time that you sold it it doesn't make sense um, so it, it can't match the physical flow there are some things that um, a last in first out physical flow works so goods stored in piles such as coal or hay uh, another example I like to use is salt if you think about uh, salt for the roads um, in the winter time you may get a delivery of salt in November it's sitting in a pile we have an early uh, frost or, or icy conditions on the roads they're going to take some from the pile 
they may then get another delivery of, of salt uh, to add to the pile in December. So when they the next storm comes through, they're going to take from the top of the pile. So they're taking from the last thing that was purchased. Well, the first things they purchase are at the bottom of the pile. So that what that's a, a physical flow that matches last in, first out. We're going to use the same information we saw from the FIFO example. So we have beginning inventory, 100 units, $1,000 cost. We have three purchases. So we have $1,000 units total available. And we have $12,000 cost of goods available. We still have the same 450 units in ending inventory. So when we think about the last ones in or the first ones out to cost, oops, sorry, the first ones out to cost of goods sold, in order to calculate the inventory, ending inventory, we start with the beginning inventory because that's still an inventory. So we have 100. So we have the 100 units from beginning inventory at $10, $1,000 cost. The next purchase was 200 units at 11. So 200 plus 100 is 300 units. So we take all of that, 11, 2,200. So we have 300 units accounted for so far. We need another 150. The August 24th purchase was 300 units. So we take half of that. So we have 150 units. That gets our total of 450 in ending inventory. The 150 is costed at $12, which we purchased it at. It's 1,800 is the total cost. $5,000 total make up the cost of those 450 units. Cost of goods available for sale was the $12,000 from above here. Less than our ending inventory, we calculated on the left of 5,000. Our cost of goods sold is $7,000. Another way you can approach both FIFO and LIFO is to calculate cost of goods sold basis. So we know from our first slide a few slides ago that we had 1,000 available, we have 415 ending inventory. We sold 550 using a last out, last in, first out method. We would take 400 from the last purchase, 150 from the next to last purchase, cost those out, and that would equal our $7,000. And then we could change the formula around. If we knew cost of goods sold, then we could um, calculate the ending inventory of $5,000. So that's another way. If it makes you think about it and, and remember it better, that's a way you can do it. Um, just be cautious because there's going to be problems that give you different pieces of data. So make sure you understand both ways uh, to be able to calculate it. So another look at the LIFO method. So we have the charts from the last slide. If you look at it graphically, Here's our beginning inventory, our three purchases. What's in ending inventory is what was there to the beginning in our, our first purchases. What was in cost of goods sold are the last purchases, last in, or the first out to cost of goods sold. So we took the last purchase plus half of the second to last purchase to get the $7,000 in cost of goods sold. The remaining is in our ending inventory, and that cost $5,000. So just like in the FIFO method, on the LIFO costing method, you could think about ending inventory as fish first in still here. So your beginning inventory is always going to be in your inventory unless you end up selling everything that you have. Average cost that allocates the cost of goods available for sale on the basis of a weighted average unit cost incurred. It applies the weighted average unit cost to the units on hand to determine the cost of ending inventory. So what does that look like? Have the same data, beginning inventory plus three purchases, 1,000 units available, $12,000 total cost available, 
to get the average, we simply take the $12,000 available divided by 1,000 units available, and it's $12 per unit average cost. Our ending inventory was 450 units, so we multiply that 450 times the average unit cost of $12. So our average, our cost of inventory using the average cost method is 5,400. And then our cost of goods sold is calculated by the cost of goods available, $12,000, less the ending inventory of 5,400. Cost of goods sold equals 6,600. So with this method, we don't have to worry about which was purchased first or last or what's still there or what's costed first. Um, it's just what's the total available, what's the total cost available. You take an average and you apply that to the units. And here's a graphic of it. We just put it all in a bucket, $12,000 cost, 1,000 units. It's $12 per unit. For 50 units at the $12 goes to ending inventory, and the rest goes to cost of goods sold. Here we're showing the cost of goods available of 12,000 minus the ending inventory. You could also say we sold 550 units, so the, the 550 units times $12 per unit is going to equal the 6,600 also. So you could calculate cost of goods sold that way. This chart, chart shows what companies in the U.S. use as their cost flow methods. So 45% use FIFO, so that's the most common. 24% use LIFO, that's the next most common, and 16% average. The remaining 15% is other. So it could be the specific identification we talked about, or it could be some other type of um, costing method that we don't cover in this in this class so um, you know as you can see the most is FIFO LIFO is the next most let's look at the financial statement and tax effect of the different cost flow methods each of the three cost flow methods is acceptable under GAAP so FIFO LIFO average cost so we say Reebok Wendy's, they currently use FIFO. Campbell Soup, Kroger, Walgreens use LIFO for part or all of their inventory. Okay, and what that means is they can use different methods for different types of inventory. So if it makes sense uh, to use one for one part of the inventory and another for another, that's acceptable as well. They just disclose that in their financial statements. Bristol Myers Squibb. Starbucks, Motorola, they use the average cost method. And Stanley Black & Decker uses LIFO for domestic inventories and FIFO for foreign inventories. So they're looking at not necessarily what type of inventory, like some of these companies up here, but where their inventories are located and using that cost. So how do the different methods impact the financial statements in, in taxes. So under FIFO, and this is the data that we calculated uh, in our examples, you can see the $12,000 cost of goods available across the board. Ending inventory is different that we calculated from the previous slides and the cost of goods sold differently. Okay. Under FIFO, cost of goods sold was 6200 which means gross profit was 12,300, net income 2,640. Under LIFO, we had $7,000 of cost of goods sold. So our gross profit was lower by that same $800 difference. A higher cost of goods sold is a lower gross profit, which means a lower income before taxes lower taxes and lower net income. Average cost, 5,400 in an inventory, 6,600. It's in between the two other methods, which makes sense because you're taking an average of the methods. 
6,600 cost of goods sold, gross profit is 11,900. Net in or income before taxes is higher than under LIFO, but lower than under FIFO, and taxes are the same and net income is the same. It's in between the two. So you can see with different methods, you have different income numbers and different tax numbers. Okay. We're assuming here that they pay income taxes and it's a flat 20%. Balance sheet effects. A major advantage of FIFO is that in a period of inflation, cost allocated to ending inventory will approximate their current cost. So as costs are rising, the higher cost units are the last ones you purchased. They're the ones that end up in ending inventory because under FIFO, the first ones you purchased are the first ones out to cost of goods sold. So ending inventory will approximate the current cost. As opposed to LIFO, the shortcoming there is that in a period of inflation, the cost allocated to Indian inventory may be significantly understated in terms of current cost. So if you think about um, the inflation we've had the last couple of years, under LIFO method, you could be costing your inventory with items that were purchased in 2020 or 2021, they could remain in your ending inventory. At that cost, they're not reflecting the current cost of inflation that we've had the last couple of years. So it could be really low inventory on your balance sheet because of that. We look at the other side, look at the income and tax effects. So both inventory and net income are higher when company use FIFO in a period of inflation. So net income is higher, inventory is higher because the lower cost items are the first ones out to cost of goods sold on the income statement, which makes your income lower and your or income higher, cost of goods sold is lower, income higher. FI LIFO, the second point there, results in the lowest net lowest income taxes during times of rising cost because you have a higher cost of goods sold. With a higher cost of goods sold, you have a lower gross profit. Lower gross profit means a lower income before taxes, lower taxes, lower net income. And then here it talks about this tax rule, often referred to as the LIFO conformity rule. That requires that if companies use LIFO for tax purposes, which means that the higher cost items during the time of inflation are in the cost of goods sold, which result in lower taxes, they must also use that for financial reporting purposes. So a company can't use LIFO for tax purposes to lower taxes, but then on their financial statements use FIFO to show a higher income um, which kind of mislead uh, what they're trying to do. So if, if they're using um, LIFO for the taxes, which would give them the lower tax burden, they have to show that on their financial reporting as well. Okay. Nothing to say that you can't do the opposite, but that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense if you're using LIFO for financial statements and you're showing lower income and lower taxes, but on your tax returns you're using FIFO which would have lower cost of goods sold, which would result in higher income and higher taxes. I don't think any companies would want to do that, so they don't have a rule against it. Using cost flow methods consistently. This is saying that the method used should be used consistently from one accounting period to another so that you can compare between accounting periods easily. Although that's preferred, they can change their inventory costing methods. And here's a note of Quaker Oats. I don't know what year this is from, but it's saying that the adopted LIFO cost flow assumption for the US grocery products inventories better matches current cost with current revenues. 
and that's an advantage of using LIFO, especially in times of rising costs. The effect of this change in the current year was to decrease net income by 16 million. So they're disclosing what the change, the impact was to their financial statements because of this change. So if they would have stayed with FIFO or whatever method they were using before, they would have had a higher net income of 16 million. Items like this and any other changes in accounting methods have to be disclosed like they do here, but then also the companies restate their financial statements for prior years. So a lot of times in annual reports, you might see two or three, five years of history. They have to go back and restate those under the new assumptions. So it's actually a lot of work to go back and say, all right, if we use LIFO for the past three years instead of um, FIFO, what impact is that? So you're recalculating all the cost um, under a different way and you have to show that change um, so you can so that comparability is there but if you picked up the financial statements of this year when this went into effect versus one that was published the prior year you would see different numbers for that prior year because the old one was under the old method the new ones when they re will report the history under the new way they restate them so you'll see that change there So a question, the cost flow method that often parallels the actual physical flow of merchandise is which one? Is it FIFO, first in, first out, LIFO, last in, first out, average cost, or gross profit method? And the answer is FIFO. So first in, first out, most often parallels the physical flow of inventory and it's costed the same way. Another question, in a period of inflation, the cost flow method that results in the lowest income taxes, is it FIFO, LIFO, average cost or gross profit method? So period of inflation, cost are rising, lowest net income, would mean the lowest income, which would mean higher cost of goods sold. Which method gives us that is LIFO. The last ones in, purchased at the higher cost, are the first ones into cost of goods sold. So a little bit of insight here. Is LIFO fair? ExxonMobil, like some U.S. companies, use LIFO to value its inventory for financial reporting and tax purposes. In a recent year, this resulted in a cost of goods sold figure that was $5.6 billion higher than if they would have used FIFO. By increasing the cost of goods sold, ExxonMobil reduces net income, which reduces taxes. Critics say that LIFO provides an unfair tax dodge. Congress looks for more sources of tax revenue. Some lawmakers favor the elimination of LIFO. Okay. That would mean that you couldn't use that for, for tax purposes and would basically mean that companies don't use it for financial reporting as well. Supporters of LIFO argue that the method is conceptually sound because it matches current costs with current revenues. So if costs are increasing, companies increase their prices to their customers. They have the higher prices on their financial statements. They should have the matching higher cost, which makes sense to some in, in some way. So they also point out that matching provides protection against inflation. However, the international accounting standards do not allow the use of LIFO. So we talked a little bit in the earlier chapters about IFRS and GAAP, and there's some differences. This is one of the big differences in account, international accounting. You have to use FIFO or average cost. You can't use LIFO. Some US companies are allowed to use LIFO. So that's a difference. So as they converge together, they're going to have to pick one way or the other to either to have international companies allow LIFO or eliminate LIFO for the US companies. So then if you think about the oil and gas uh, industry, 
net income of four oil companies, BP, which is in uh, Britain, Royal Dutch Shell, they're not directly comparable to U.S. companies because they could use different methods for inventory costing, and that makes the analysis differ, difficult. Again, what are the arguments for and against the use of, of LIFO? The proponents say that LIFO is conceptually superior because it matches the most recent cost with the most recent selling price. Critics say that it artificially interstates the company net income, consequently reduces tax payments. And because most foreign companies are not allowed to use LIFO, its use by U.S. companies reduces the ability of investors to compare U.S. companies with foreign companies. So it'll take a while, I think, for this discussion to continue and, and any decisions to be made. But my thought is if they continue to converge IFRS and GAAP standards, this is probably one that will make LIFO go away since, since the international standards aren't using it. So we're going to walk through a couple of examples here. And, and, and this do it. The accounting records of Shemway Ag implement show the following data. Beginning inventory is 4,000 units at $3. Purchases of 6,000 units at $4. Sales of 7,000 units at $12. Determine the cost of goods sold during the period under periodic inventory system using FIFO, LIFO, average cost method. So when, before we start into this, think about what data is necessary to, to tackle this. There's some common data that, that's necessary. So if we look at it, our cost of goods available for sale is the same in all three methods. So that's our beginning inventory, 4,000 units at $3, and the purchase of 6,000 units at $4, so $36,000 of cost of goods available for sale. Okay. We can also look at the unit side, units of 4,000 plus the purchase of 6,000. So we had 10,000 units available for sale. Our ending inventory then is our 10,000 units available minus 7,000 units sold. So we have 3,000 units in ending inventory. So those facts are the same in all three cost flow methods. And we're going to base all of our analysis off of this starting point and these common points. Okay. Now, in this information, it says we sold 7,000 units at $12. Is the fact that we sold them for $12 important in this analysis? The answer there is no because we're looking at inventory costing methods, not income statement or gross profit analysis. There are going to be some homework problems where it will be important because it'll say what is, it may say what is the gross profit under the FIFO method, the LIFO method, or the average cost method. So in addition to calculating the cost flow, like we're going to do here, you also have to calculate the sales. So that would be important then to calculate and, and know that information. The sales minus the cost of goods sold is the gross profit. So just be aware of that as you're looking at the homework problems and on the exams, what they're asking for and what data you need to use from the data that you're given. So if we look at the FIFO method, we have $36,000 available for sale. We have $3,000 in ending, ending inventory. If we use FIFO, first out, first in, first out, that means what's in our ending inventory is the items from the last purchase. So coming out of the 6,000 units at $4 purchase will be what's in our ending inventory. So under FIFO, we take the $36,000 available minus 3,000 units at $4 from our last purchase. So 
FIFO ending inventory or FIFO cost of goods sold is $24,000. Ending inventory is the $12,000. Under LIFO, last in is the first out to cost of goods sold. So what remains in ending inventory is from our beginning inventory. We have 3,000 units of ending inventory. So we only have 3,000 at $3. So if we look at the LIFO, we take what's available, the same $36,000. We subtract the 3,000 at $3, so $9,000 of ending inventory. And our cost of goods sold under LIFO is $27,000. And lastly, we have our average cost. So we have to calculate what the average cost per unit is. Okay. We do that by taking total cost of goods available for sale, $36,000, divided by, in, by units available for sale, the $10,000, to get an average cost and apply that to units. So our average cost per unit is $3.60. We apply that to our units. So our ending inventory of 3,000 units times the $3.60. We take our cost of goods available, less than an ending inventory amount, and our cost of goods sold is $25,200. You'll see a lot of these more examples when we when you look at the notes video uh, you know I would recommend you trying to work through some of those examples on the notes before you watch the video just to see if you're understanding or not but then in the notes I'll explain through what um, how the calculations are done and in different ways to look at it um, and, and calculate it um, and then again on the homework there's going to be a lot of questions that um, same set of data and you need to either need to figure out ending inventory or cost of goods sold in some cases gross profit under different cost flow methods but this is the basic way to do it i think looking at something like this example where there's just some in beginning inventory and one purchase sometimes helps understand where it's coming from instead of having to go into different layers but that's a little bit more complicated. Um, so if you if you can understand this, then you can apply it to if we had more than one purchase in um, inventory that that either spreads it or sales that spread throughout the different um, layers uh, will, will provides a little bit more difficulty. Now we'll look at the effects of inventory errors on the financial statements. So errors happen. We've talked about that before. If, it, if it's truly an error, it's not intentional, it's not unethical or anything, but you have to understand what the um, uh, impact of that is and how to correct it. So some common causes of errors is failure to count or cost inventory correctly. So you're not properly recognizing the transfer of legal title to goods in transit. So you either forget to add in inventory that's in transit to you that you own. If you're shipping things out, FOB destination, it's not in your warehouse, you don't count it, you may forget to add that back to your inventory because you still own it until it gets to the, um, uh, it, you know, it gets to the buyer's location. Okay, and that's a big thing that we had to do a lot in, in practice is looking at what shipments happen, taking average shipment times and trying to determine which ones could still be in inventory. So that was always a big um, uh, calculation that we had to do and something that the auditors looked closely at um, is your, your goods in transit and how did you handle those and did you account for them correctly. And then errors on inventory affect both the income statement and the balance sheet. We'll look at how that impacts it. So we have beginning inventory plus cost of goods purchased minus any inventory is cost of goods sold. So if we have a mistake in either beginning or any inventory, that's going to impact our cost of goods sold. And if cost of goods sold is impacted, not only is our inventory wrong on the balance sheet, 
our cost of goods sold will be incorrect on the income statement and impact net income. So if we understate beginning inventory, cost of goods sold is understated, and that means net income is overstated. If we overstate beginning inventory, that means the cost of goods sold is overstated, and the net income is understated. If we understate ending inventory, cost of goods sold is overstated, and net income is understated. And if we overstate ending inventory, we understated cost of goods sold and overstated net income. So this is a chart you should become familiar with. It's going to be questions on the homework and on exams of here's an inventory error and I'll ask you what the impact is in cost of goods sold or net income or on the balance sheet. So make sure you understand what those errors mean. If we have an error in inventory, that's going to affect the computation of cost of goods sold and net income in two periods. So an error in any inventory of the current period will have a reverse effect on net income of the next accounting period. Over the two years, the total net income is correct because the errors offset each other. So the two year total will be correct, but it'll be wrong in each year. Ending inventory depends entirely on the accuracy of counting and costing the inventory. Let's look at an illustration of what that means. So we have two years of data, 2001, 2021, 2022. In the shaded area is the incorrect numbers. Correct numbers or incorrect numbers here, the correct numbers are in the white. So we have ending inventory of $12,000 in 2021. It should have been $15,000. So we have an error in our ending inventory. That means cost of goods sold was incorrectly overstated. So it was 48,000 instead of 45,000. Our net income was 22,000 in the incorrect version. It should have been 25,000, a $3,000 net income understatement. So with ending inventory in 2021 incorrect, that means our beginning inventory in 2022 is incorrect as well. So we have an understatement of beginning inventory compared to what it should have been. That understatement in beginning inventory makes our cost of goods sold understated. So we had $57,000 of cost of goods sold in 2022. We should have had $60,000 of cost of goods sold. That comes down to net income. So our net income of $13,000 is higher than the $10,000 we should have had. Understated gross cost, understated cost of goods sold means overstated net income. So we have a $3,000 net income overstatement in 2022. So for the two year period, the errors cancel each other out. 3,000 understated in year one, 3,000 overstated in year two. We should have had 25,000 plus 10,000, the correct net income each year, it's $35,000. Instead, we had 22,000 in year one, 13,000 in year two. The two year total is still $35,000. So we say that an error in inventory, ending inventory self-corrects itself in two years. So a question, understanding Indian inventory will overstate, is it assets, cost of goods sold, net income, or stockholders equity? If ending inventory is understated, that means cost of goods sold will be overstated. Now looking at the balance sheet effects of inventory errors. Remember assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. 
errors in the ending inventory have the following effects. If ending inventory error is overstated ending inventory, it means our assets are understated, overstated, overstated inventory, overstated assets, no impact on liabilities, our stockholders equity will be overstated. And that's because when we flow that air through the income statement, we'll have overstated uh, net income. If the ending inventory air is understated, so we have lower inventory than we should have, assets are understated, again, no effect on liabilities, and our stockholders equity is understated because it flows through the income statement and understates our net income. Look at another do it. Visual company overstated its 2021 ending inventory by $22,000. Determine the impact of this, this error has on ending inventory, cost of goods sold, and stockholders equity in 2021 and 2022. So here's our solution down here already. 2021 ending inventory was $22,000 overstated. Because of only this error, that has no impact, no effect on the 2022 ending inventory. The beginning inventory will be overstated, but we assume that we correct it and that our ending inventory in 2022 is correct. The cost of goods sold in 2021 is understated by the $22,000. So we have an overstatement in ending inventory understatement in cost of goods sold. If we have an understatement in cost of goods sold, it means an overstatement in gross profit, overstatement in net income. So we have an overstatement in stockholders equity in 2021. 2022, again, no effect on the Indian inventory. The beginning inventory was wrong, but it's a self-correcting error, we say. So ending inventory is correct at 2022. Cost of goods sold would be overstated in 2022 by the $22,000. Overstated cost of goods sold means an understated gross profit, understated net income. So net income is understated in 2022, but it was overstated in 2021. So the impact on stockholders equity in 2022 is no effect because the ending stockholders equity is correct. So another example of how the error self corrects itself. Now we'll look at the statement presentation analysis of inventory. Presentation, we talked about it earlier. It's on the balance sheet for inventory. It's classified as a current asset. On the income statement, we've gone through this in, in different examples. Cost of goods sold is subtracted from sales to get gross profit. And then um, gross profit is drives net income. There, all, there also should be disclosure of the major inventory classifications. So on the face of the balance sheet, you may just see inventory, but then there'll be a note to the financial statement that says how much is raw materials, how much is work in process, how much is finished goods, or some companies show that in the face of the balance sheet them, itself. There should be disclosure about the basis of accounting. So it's either cost or lower a cost of net realizable value. We'll cover that in a minute. Um, it's a new concept, but um, you should disclose how you accounted for your inventory. And then you should disclose which method you use for costing, FIFO, LIFO, or average cost. Or as we saw, there's some other ones, some other, it could be another costing method. Lower of cost or net realizable value. This is a concept that 
we record inventory at cost except if the inventory value is lower than the cost. So if that happens, companies must write down the inventory to its net realizable value. What does that mean? The net realizable value is the amount that a company expects to realize or receive from the sale of inventory. And this is an example of conservatism. So we've seen in different and talked about it a couple different times. We'll see it again in some other examples that if a value decreases, we sometimes write down or lower the value on our financial statements for, for the balance sheet in, in particular. If the value increases, we very rarely, almost never increase the value. And we'll talk about in future chapters some examples of when we would increase those values. So the conservatism view is that you write down if the value decreases, you don't write up if the value increases. So how do you calculate lower cost of net realizable value? So we'll look at this example here. Assume that Kentucky TV has the following lines of merchandise with costs and net realizable values indicated. So we have different types of inventory, flat screen TV, satellite radios, DVD recorders, DVDs, the units, the cost per unit, and then the net realizable value per unit, which means what can we sell that inventory for? Okay. Lower of cost or net realizable value simply for each category of inventory. So we'll take flat screen TVs first. Cost is 600, net realizable value is 550. We take the lower of those two. In this case, it's the net realizable value. So the $550 times the units. And that's what value our inventory should be at. Satellite radios, cost is 90. We can sell it for a lot more than our cost. So we're going to use our cost because since that's lower, DVD recorders, cost is 50. We can only sell them for 48. So we value the inventory at the lower amount, 48. And DVDs, cost is lower than what we can sell them for. So we value that at cost. We then add up the different categories to get the total inventory. But then we can say that the inventory is recorded at the lower of cost or net realizable value, even though different categories are different because you look at them at different categories. Inventory management. Inventory management is very important for companies. It's something that all companies struggle with, all companies focus on. We saw some examples earlier in the chapter about when or how you can manipulate inventory to manipulate the numbers. So it's a it's a focus. Um, it, honest companies and ethical companies want to make sure they're correct, so they're not, you know, being accused of manipulating the earnings. It's going to be something that auditors look at in detail to make sure it's accounted for. But when you think about managing inventories. If you have a high inventory levels, you may incur high carrying costs. So you're tying up cash in that, in the, that you bought the inventory. Um, you may have storage costs. You may have insurance. You have a risk of obsolescence. So if it's changing technology or something, you could have inventory that you, you can't sell. It could be damaged. If you have low inventory levels, though, it may lead to stockouts and lost sales. So you need to find that balance of having the right amount of inventory of the right kind to sell to your customers when they want it compared to managing that and not tying up more costs and uh, running the risk of loss and um, obsolescence. Here are some analysis that companies use. Inventory turnover. And days in inventory. Inventory turnover is measuring the number of times on average the inventory is sold during the period. It simply takes the cost of goods sold amount divided by the average inventory. 
and we use a simple average, so beginning and ending divided by two. Days in inventory measures how many days the inventory is held, how many days until you turn that inventory over. You take the days in the year, 365, divided by the inventory turnover amount. So you calculate the inventory turnover first, then you can divide that into 365 to get days in inventory. Here's an example for Walmart. They reported January 31st, 2016 annual report, beginning inventory of 45,141 billion, that's billion dollars, so it's 45,000 million. Ending inventory of 44 billion dollars. And cost of goods sold for the year was 360, almost 361 billion dollars. The inventory turnover formula and computation for Walmart are shown below. So cost of goods sold, 360,984, divided by the average inventory, beginning plus ending divided by two, inventory turnover, 8.1 times. So this is for a whole year, so they're turning their inventory over eight times a year. Days in inventory, inventory turnover 8.1 divided into 365 is approximately 45 days. So that's the approximate time that it takes a company to sell the inventory. So what this means is that every 45 days, Walmart is selling their inventory, which averages about 45 billion dollars. So they're selling 45 billion dollars worth of goods every month and a half. Here's a do it. Tracy Company sells three different types of home heating stoves, gas, wood, and pellet. The cost and net realizable value of its inventory of stoves is as follows. So we have gas, cost of 84,000, net realizable value 79,000. Wood, $250,000 cost, $280,000 net realizable value. Pellet, cost $112,000, net realizable value $101,000. We need to determine the company's inventory under the lower of cost or net realizable value approach. In order to do that, we look at each type of inventory, gas, wooden pellet individually, compare the cost and the net realizable value, take the lower, and then we add them up. So the solution is gas, the net realizable value is lower, 79,000. Wood, the cost is lower, so we use $250,000. And pellet, net realizable value is lower, 101,000. Total inventory value is the sum of these, so $430,000 would be the cost of our inventory on our balance sheet. This is an example of accounting and how do you, you know, manage your inventory. This is Sony. So their financial analysts are closely monitoring the inventory management practices. Some analysts following Sony expressed concern because the company built up its inventory of televisions in an attempt to sell 25 million LCD TVs. So they wanted to increase their inventory, they increase their sales, so they're increasing their inventory to match those sales. So that was a 60% increase over the prior year. In that prior year, Sony had cut its inventory levels, so its quarterly days in inventories was down to 38 days compared to 61 days the year before that. So they're at 61 days, they cut it to 38. Now they're building up their inventory again and the days in inventory rose to 59 days, which was closer to two years ago. Management said it didn't think that the inventory levels were too high. Analysts were concerned that the company would have to engage in very heavy discounting. So putting the, uh, you know, putting their TVs on sale at a lower cost to, in order to sell their inventory. And they noted that losses from discounting can be punishing to a company. 
what are the advantages and disadvantages of Sony, of Sony having low days in inventory? If they have low days inventory, reduces the amount of cash that is tied up in inventory. It can use cash for something else. Also minimizes risk that it will be stuck with excess inventory that could force it to provide big discounts, resulting in losses. They also face the risk that TVs will become obsolete before they are sold. On the other side, though, they increase the risk that they won't counter stockouts. So if they do increase their sales and they don't have the inventory to support it, they're going to not have the TVs to sell. People that want to buy a Sony TV might get frustrated with Sony and go to a different brand. So they're going to lose uh, sales, not only for this sales, they may lose sales in the future too if somebody switches to different brands and that type of things. So it's a very fine line that companies have to manage. How much cash do they put towards their inventory to build that up to meet the demand that they think they're going to have? How accurate is their demand? To, to know what inventory there should have on hand. So there's a lot of moving parts with inventory management, but it's very important for companies. That's the end of chapter six. If you have questions, again, let me know. Look at the notes, documents, try to figure out some of those answers themselves, then watch that video and you can see which ones you got right and hopefully clear up any questions you have. Thank you.